All right, hello everybody. Um, back with right, another. Oh, I can um, hear myself for some reason. Just a second. That's better. So, hello. Uh, I'm here with another live coding session. Uh, this time we will look at the big new release of Uno Platform 3.1, uh, which was released on Friday. Uh, although that's a dangerous thing to do, releases releases on Friday. We went ahead with that yeah, anyway, and it actually didn't go wrong. So that's a good, uh, good news. Um, I'll be showing some of the coolest new features that are added in 3.1. And uh, if you have any questions about anything, you can definitely post those questions in, in the chat. I will be uh, checking it as we go. All right, so let me build the WebAssembly solution as that's going to be the place where I'll be showing most of the uh, new features. And there's actually a lot of new things which with Uno Platform 3.1. Uh, I will highlight just the most interesting new features and you can go over the whole uh, change log in, in, uh, on GitHub. So I'll go here. There is a releases section here and you can see 3.1.6 as the re latest release which contains all the changes. There is a lot of new features, new bug fixes, and uh, also some refactoring and so on. Uh, so let's start with uh, let's start with those things which I don't have to show before it actually builds. Um, so uh, from the bug fixes, there were many changes. Uh, concerning list views, uh, containers, uh, list view containers and list view uh, selection and so on, just to make it more match to match UWP and uh, so, uh, so synchronize uh, the functionality of UWP with uh, Uno platform. So now you can provide now list view items can provide can be there themselves the containers of the list view item. Uh, that, that allows many scenarios, including the tree view and tab view, which I'll be uh, showing later. Uh, the selection of items, including selection index and so on, that's gonna that's, that was improved as well. And now the selection events are actually showing the proper uh, proper changes. Before we had, for example, when you selected an item and then selected another one with single selection, then two. Uh, events were raised now it's only one and is showing one removed and one added item so it's more in line with what UWP actually does. Uh, there were some other changes with the launch like now on launch event is not uh, called again when it's the application is already running which was uh, problematic on Android and there were a lot of changes and fixes around Skia and Skia input <clears throat> And yeah, so, so from bug fixes, that will be probably uh, all that's worth highlighting. But now for the features, there is a lot of new features as well. And, and I will actually be showing most of them in the browser with WebAssembly. So let's zoom in a little bit and let's take a look. So what from the new features, uh, we can show that uh, scroll viewer scroll bar is now behaving more like in UWP. So if you're not, uh, if you open a scroll bar, it actually uh, expands to be more like the window scroll bar. For some reason now, I, <laughs> but as I s uh, zoomed in, it doesn't work uh, as I expect, but it behaves more like the UWP scroll bar, which is uh, small when it's closed bar and uh, then expands when you hover over the mouse in the area where the scroll bar is. Uh, let's wait a little bit for it to load. Uh, so this scroll view feature is available in WebAssembly now. It will be uh, then added to the other platforms as well. But uh, this is just an initial uh, initial release of the feature. And it's, it's more uh, user-friendly and uh, it doesn't 
take the space from the control which has the scroll bar inside so it's better this way and so the next feature you can show is color picker but it's not available in WebAssembly so I will show it later in Android uh, next one is tree view that tree view is a VNUI control and it actually is available across all platforms uh, including WebAssembly, macOS and uh, even Skia so for a simple example let's see tree view basics so tree view is a hierarchical control which shows a hierarchy you can select items you can expand them and close them so like this we have expandable tree view and it has a lot of features uh, in tree view so i will open this example sample page which is from WinUI and it has much more much more samples than this uh, let's wait a little bit it's a huge test page it's, it's a lot of it tests a lot of scenarios um, but we can see that it the control itself even supports multiple selection let's see toggle selection mode so you can select multiple items and it has this um, visualization so when you select all items it selects uh, it selects the root as well and otherwise it's just intermediately selected and so on so it's very very powerful control and enables a lot of new scenarios which were not uh, possible before uh, one thing worth noting is the tree view is not the same thing as the navigation view hierarchic uh, hierarchical um, feature that's available in WinUI that is coming probably in uh, UNO platform 3.2 if we are able to implement the repeater and other, other features that are required for it and the navigation view itself uh, is currently just a single single level right so that was tree view there is also a new control tab view which is also uh, which is limited to uh, Skia and WebAssembly it's not available on the other platforms yet as we have to make some fundamental changes for uh, for the list view control to work uh, the same way as in the UWP <clears throat> but the tab view uh, works reasonably well in WebAssembly and Skia now and you can see it's uh, displaying tabs which you can switch and display some content on them uh, this is not actually hooked up to anything so it doesn't do add any new tab but if I go here there should be an example of adding a new tab as well right go hmm oh this not this one uh, yeah so this is a basic page and this page uh, it's again a huge sample page and we are running in a non-optimized non-AOT version of WebAssembly so it's taking a longer time to actually load or does it even load maybe the page was disabled before it was merged but uh, like the, the pause button allows you to add a new tab and display new content based on for, for example if you have data binding to the tab view you can data bind multiple tabs and show different content based on that all right so that's for tab view uh, one and uh, one cool feature that we added uh, is with uh, storage files there is not a sample for it i think but uh, we now support the get file from application URI async method which allows you to take a file which is embedded in the application package and this method is again supported across all platforms we have so it enables the scenarios of having uh, some assets that you want to load and for example read from uh, from your application package at runtime uh, up next we have some XBind improvements uh, this again doesn't have any UI sample but 
uh, we can now do data binding to plain fields in code behind and also uh, xbind has some performance improvements and we now support the bindings dot update method to update whole uh, the whole uh, bindings of the page or a given control to update all of its uh, bindings so that's very useful and will light up uh, many uh, scenarios for ported controls from UWP. All right, next one, um, we have uh, some new features in the Windows globalization uh, globalization namespace. There is no f example page for it, but the calendar, the calendar APIs were significantly expanded. And that's because we want to implement the data picker and time picker components which are not yet available and with these with these uh, new features in calendar APIs we will be able to do those. Uh, next we have a folder picker and that's for macOS. Um, Web, uh, WebAssembly doesn't have that uh, yet but uh, Arlo got free from uh, from the UWP community is working on it and uh, we have we have actually made a live stream on Sunday where, where we were able to actually open a folder and enumerate uh, its subfolders so that was a successful stream and you can uh, play it back on YouTube or in the library here on on Twitch and uh, the folder picker on macOS actually does display the, list, uh, the folder browser. You can pick a folder and then read from it. Uh, basically the same way as uh, you would on Windows, uh, just with the macOS interface. Uh, next up, uh, we have new batch notification API, uh, which allows you to add badges for your icons. I can show it. Um, uh, for exa example here, batch notifications. So this is the feature, it allows you to show a numeric batch on the application icon to show the user there is a new notification, there is there are new updates or something like that. And the API is again completely the same as in UWP, but it's available now on iOS and macOS. And I'm actually working now on support for Tizen and WebAssembly as well, as there is a JS batch uh, badging API, which is a completely new thing and it's still quite uh, early in support, but it allows web apps which are installed or um, pinned to home screen to show a small uh, notification like a num numeric badge. That's the same thing as uh, on in here for for Windows, it works again for WebAssembly pinned applications and should be possible to use it on Android and Windows currently, hopefully in the future in iOS as well. Uh, so the badging API, I'm not sure if I can show it here in the browser, probably can. So there is an actual demo for for this. So if I install this demo application so it's now pinned to my taskbar and I set the badge value you can see it uh, showed up here the number 42 so so this allows this scenario of having a more uh, having a, the page behave more like an actual application that it can show numeric uh, notifications in the taskbar all right, so that would be for badging. And at this, this feature, this badging for WebAssembly and Tizen should be available in Uno Platform uh, 3.2. So stay, stay tuned for that. One big change and why, uh, one that will be definitely appro uh, appreciated by many users of WebAssembly uh, or WebAssembly Uno Platform is that now page background property is actually working so you no longer have to set the background to the root grid and you can set it on the page and it will display properly so that was a source of many problems for users uh, which were using Uno platform for the first time as 
in UWP, the page background is settable, uh, but on Uno platform it wasn't. And the weird thing is that uh, actually page is the only control which has its background uh, visible. And so, so that, that that's discrepancy between uh, normal controls and page was uh, something that haunted us for a longer time and now it's fixed. And it was actually a quite easy fix, but it will make building apps much, much easier. Uh, one interesting thing that we did also is voiceover support for WebAssembly. So WebAssembly applications can now improve their accessibility by implementing the proper vo voiceover uh, functionality. And uh, I can show the, uh, show the PR for that here. So voiceover voice. Yeah, this one. So there is actually a uh, documentation page for this and you can see how to enable the automation properties and set the accessibility properties properly so that your application uh, can be easily read by screen readers and is more accessible for the users. So if you want to check it out, it is, there's an accessibility section in the in the documentation it's also on the website so platform.uno if we go here then in the docs we have features and controls and there is accessibility and that, that explains basically how to use this feature and how to even test the screen reader functionality on each of the each of the uh, each of the uh, platforms and for WebAssembly it's uh, possible to enable it from the browser settings as well. All right, so that's, that's that and um, one more interesting thing, I can probably switch to Android to show the rest of the features that we have here. So let's do that. Let's go to Android. Kill this one and relaunch with Android only solution. So let's go. So the things I want to show on the Android example is the color picker, which is very cool, community edition, and it's uh, based on the WinUI color picker in, uh, actually it's ported WinUI color picker to Android and iOS. And also we have user profile personalization API, which allows you to set wallpapers. So both of these uh, should be quite interesting to show once the Android solution loads. Uh, here we go. And let's launch it on this tablet device. <clears throat> Android, Android is in general very performance intensive. So building it takes a lot of resources. So in the meantime, before it actually launches, we will make a photo here that we will try to set as the wallpaper. Ah, pretty nice. Right. That's that. Now let's wait for it to. Well, maybe we have all the features here already. I will check if I uh, actually deployed to this device recently. So here we have color picker and let's do color picker sample. 
so this is a color picker control is full featured you can pick a color in the in this um, image and then use the sliders to adjust the color plus the opacity and you can even uh, in, input uh, the specific colors manually using these input fields so it's very cool and very useful for personalization or if you have a application that provides um, drawing cap capabilities or something like that this control is going to be very useful for you and this is a test page with a lot of different tests uh, many things of this of this huge control can be turned off so you can remove the color slider color preview or even just show the input fields so it's perfectly customizable and you can make sure that your that the control looks exactly as you want it to look on the specific uh, on the specific con uh, place where you want to show it and maybe it's even possible to maybe it's even possible to change the shape to a ring yeah so we can change the shape to have a to have this nice color picker ring and even change the values that are being picked and so on so it's very very advanced and very very useful right so that's Vinui color picker and next I want to try to show as well the user profile personalization and where that is I'm not sure hmm not here not here well badging ah oh, that's not available on Android so I cannot show that hmm actually not sure where the user personalization feature is user personalization There you go. So Windows System User Profile. Windows System. Ah, oh, here we go. So let's try setting a wallpaper. Yeah, there is actually a wallpaper um, included with the application. So I can set it just by clicking the buttons. You can see it set wallpaper to this W and the lock screen should be also set ah can I lock the device somehow not sure if that's possible it automatically unlocks hmm well you have to trust me that the lock screen is also set <laughs> maybe here you can see it on settings now not here so this API is available on Android and it's not available on the other platforms which actually do like the wallpaper setting APIs. So both, both iOS and macOS don't support this and JavaScript doesn't allow this as well. So WebAssembly doesn't have it either. Well, I cannot probably show the current wallpaper here, but uh, it's definitely set to a image from the application. All right, so that's user profile personalization. And that's probably the last of the major new features that are available in Uno Platform 3.1. There are many others, a small, many other small features like also performance improvements, bug fixes. And there is also a great partnership we have with Prism and Prism um, has now a new UNO platform template which you can use to create a brand new Prism application using a uh, UNO platform and then build, build from that using the great Prism MVVM library which is great. And big shout out to the team from Prism uh, which made it possible. So let's go to Prism GitHub Maybe I can show it uh, from there is a link directly from the release notes. 
There you go. Releases and there is here we go. So you can see Prism in point zero, uh, which RTM'd just seven days ago. Uh, so there is a lot of new features and included among those is Uno platform support for for Prism and it's super easy to integrate it in your application and build MVVM based apps with Uno. Alright, so Brian and Dan, thank you for uh, helping us integrate Uno platform in Prism as well. And we are happy to have uh, first party support for another, another MVVM library. Right. So I will just close it just to here before it's. Oh, it's actually launching the Android application now. Yeah, the building of Android takes a long time. So. So now it's running, mm. but I showed everything important, so I can probably stop it for now. Yeah, good. All right, let's close this and let's continue with the stream. So the second part of the stream would be to uh, continue building the gamepad support uh, that we started a long time ago. Um, I actually have a draft PR open for it. So let's find it quickly here. So there is gamepad, gamepad API. And what we currently have is recognizing connected devices, recognizing disconnected devices, and you know, tracking the number of connected devices and uh, being able to enumerate the instances of them. What we don't have is the actual, actual uh, interaction with the device or reading the state of the gamepad. So that's something we would like to start today. Uh, at least start because it's going to be a complicated thing, at, especially because we have to support multiple different platforms. So we will start with that today, like with the shared and core infrastructure, and then continue uh, in some uh, future streams implementing uh, specific platforms one by one. So let's see where we are here. So. I actually rebased to the latest master, so the changes should be quite minimal. So we have gamepad enumeration. Uh, that's a sample page for enumerating gamepads. Then uh, the gamepad class for WebAssembly, then for Android, and some shared code, iOS, macOS, and finally WebAssembly. All right, what I actually made here as well, uh, there are some notes for resources, which we will definitely need. There, is, there are resources for iOS, Android, WebAssembly, Tizen, which also has game, uh, gamepad support, but when I started this PR, the Tizen was not supported in Uno platform, and now it is, so we can add support for Tizen as well. But for now, let's focus on the basics. So I will switch to WebAssembly and start implementing some, some of the shared features. Okay. And let's go maybe to EWP. WPP gamepad and see what's there. So here in pro we have properties. Uh, we have only the gamepads collection implemented, but not the others. So that's gonna be 
something to look at if uh, at least some of those are possible to implement. And then we have methods in which we have these and to also read the most interesting ones. Uh, I would like to focus on the get current reading as that API is the key one uh, that retrieves the current reading of the gamepad. And for that one, we need this gamepad reading struct. So let's let's look at uh, what this struct uh, actually does. So it has fields for buttons, which are the gamepad buttons and the state of them. And then uh, thumbsticks, triggers, and also a timestamp, which says when the state was actually retrieved. So you can adjust accordingly when the input was uh, actually occurred during execution. Right, so let's let's go to gamepad reading. And let's implement this API. <clears throat> we'll need gamepad buttons as well. So I will take this and this and move them into gaming input. Or are we, ah, we are not on the branch we want to be. So let's close it and switch to it. Gamepad, this one, relaunch. Let's see. All right, so gamepad reading and gamepad buttons. We take those and put them in gaming input. And let's implement those. It's going to be easy. Just simple struct and simple enum. So there's nothing too complicated about that. Just to remove all these directives. Good. So that's that. And from gamepad reading, again the same thing. Oh. Good. And those are just fields, which is interesting that it's not a property, but we have just fields here. Nice. And uh, next we have to remove these old generated classes. So let's replace this with false across the whole document. And the same thing for gamepad buttons. False and done. Good. That's pretty good. Right, with this in hand, uh, let's actually add documentation just to have it nice. So for the uh, gamepad reading, let's do represents the current state of game. Oh, I'm in the wrong file, right? Right, I need to be in a side of here. Gamepad reading. And let's do Buttons. Although this is not uh, really required, it's a nice thing to have as if you're gonna be developing an application and using these APIs, but not targeting or not uh, have not selected UWP as the target, then 
you will still see the documentation, which is which is useful and makes makes things a little bit easier. Also, it's it's making the uh, Uno platform source code more readable. So why not do it when we have the chance? Thumbstick. Right trigger and finally timestamp. Uh, I'm too interested to win which format the timestamp is, but we'll have to probably test that manually. And now for the gamepad buttons, can add uh, specifies button type, that should be enough. And it says actually that it has a flags attribute, uh, which means we have, a, we have it wrong here as the values. Oh, it froze. Okay. Uh, because the values we have here are just uh, the generated one, two, three, four. So we will have to uh, make sure the values match what we have in UWP. None is zero, A is four, B is eight, uh, deep it down, deep it left, deep it right. Uh, and it's a uh, flex enum, so I don't have to have to make make it here clear. Uh, this allows us to combine any combination of those of those uh, buttons in a single property. So if uh, I press multiple buttons at once, uh, I can then check if a given flag is turned on or not. So that's the, that's the way uh, this works. So let's do view button, it's two. Oh, it's, oh correct, right. So. Why am I doing this this way? Actually, quite easy and quite clear. Just may have to make sure that the order is really, really okay how it should be. So, eight, six, and two, and now I will have to check the numbers because I don't remember them. Uh, 3, 2, 7, 6, 8. Actually could use the right shift of two, like these values. Does it show me the number? Ah, whatever, I will <laughs> just do it like this for now. But that way would be easier, I guess. Right, so this is it. Looks good. So that should be enough. So when we have now gamepad buttons and gamepad reading. And so now let's probably, uh, let's, let's look at uh, some examples of the gamepad state in WebAssembly and how it actually operates there. I have here an example. So what we have is gamepad connected, disconnected and querying the gamepad object. So that should be what interests us here. So there is an index ID and buttons, length and button axis. So we need to figure out how the buttons are mapped and axis and how it actually all connects to these uh, specific types of controls on the gamepad. 
But for that, I will probably need a <laughs> actual gamepad here, as we don't have it. Uh, I don't have it here, so I will I'll fetch it. Just a second. Connect. Mm -hmm. I don't have it here, so this should be it. And it's connected. All right. It's nice that you can control Windows using a gamepad as well. Okay, let's go to web, some example on the web. So gamepad, demo, maybe this one. Uh huh. I have it connected, but it's not working. I guess it's because it's not HTTPS. It's pretty possible mm, maybe this all right so we have mm, let's do something simple first so the a button so it seems to be mapped to some b0 like the first button it seems like there's an order to it a b x y the question is uh, how does this uh, mapping look for PlayStation? Because I have, I'm not sure and I don't have it at hand here, but I guess the the A button, whatever it is, should be the B0 as is the as is the confirmation button. So let's let's suppose that's the case. Uh, X is zero is the left thumbstick axis 2 is the right thumbstick uh, or 2 axis uh, axis 2 is uh, the horizontal of right thumbstick and axis 0 is horizontal of left uh, one is up and down is uh, uh, epsilon epsilon and the, the right thumbstick epsilon is here so that's pretty nice. I guess uh, that's gonna be the same thing on PlayStation. The left one will be zero and one, and the right one will be two and three. And how do we get to them? So, I am mapping axes. So these will be the axes that we have access to. And there's also, also timestamp, which is very useful. That's what we need for the time information. And navigation start. All right. Seems reasonable. So now, how do we query the gamepad? Let's see. So uh, it works by polling, which is what we need, as we have a method that retrieves the reading. And what it does is gets a given gamepad, and with that. It, it can just read the axis and buttons uh, properties. And those should be just arrays. <coughs> Let's see, gamepad, axis. And then yeah, this sets an array of double, so it gives the positioning and buttons should be boolean or no, this gamepad button gamepad button yeah has a value so it if, if the button allowed some middle pressing then it could even give a range 
or oh, it's normalized. So, huh? I'm not sure why why there is there are two different values for this, <clears throat> like value and pressed, because both should actually give you the same result if this is normalized. Or no, so it's normalized to the range, but it should give you the real pressing value. But I guess that most of controllers won't have this, like as we've seen for, for this one, it's just zero on one, if it's pressed or not pressed. So I guess that's fine. Not sure what the timestamp is based on or if it's a time since launch of the page. Why is no gamepad detected? Yes. So yeah, probably it. So it's a second a millisecond since the page is loaded. Or not since the page is loaded, since the device is first uh, recognized. Right. So let's go to here WebAssembly TS Windows Device Gaming Input Gamepad. And what do we have here now? Good. So we have types for it, so this that's useful. And what we have now is returning the index of individual gamepads, which is then used to identify those. I'm not sure why index, but not ID, but I guess the ID wasn't reliable. Or we actually need the index as the, it's the, that's the positioning of the controller in the array, and that should be changing. Uh, then Sigla is asking if there are docs for adding Windows 7 head to Uno project and I think that there are no there are no docs for it right now. I'm not sure actually uh, but, but I, I guess there are not yet but if you create a new application uh, with the current templates you should get WPF application there uh, skia.wpf project there so if you make a new solution with the same project, uh, same same name as an existing, and as an existing project, then you can basically copy paste the Skia WPF project into your existing one and just run it there. Right. So the present template doesn't have Linux WPF. Hmm. Yeah. I guess uh, I guess the same same uh, approach can be used, like to create a. Yeah, create a sample application, take the CS approach, just rename it and adjust it to match accordingly. But it, it, the, the CS approach files for for the project should be just very simple. Uh, WPF should be just a few lines of code, like the w, use WPF property and so on. But it shouldn't be, not, should be nothing complicated, so it should be possible to add it quite simply. I'm not sure if I can find an example based on this one source. Uh, maybe maybe based on this, there is a library no library template, but solution template there is Skia WPF, and you can see the CS approach there. Yeah, so, so it's just including some of the packages, including the shared project. And this for XAML should be hopefully without any special issues. And the program file, yeah, so, so that's even seems to be empty for some reason. Uh, yeah, because there is actually a WPF host as well. So you need both of these for WPF. This, this is the host and that one is uh, a provider for WPF. I'm not sure why why it's needed, but you need both of these, and the host yeah, is again referencing some packages, and this has the WPF properties, targeting target framework, yeah. So 
when you have these two projects there, you should be okay, hopefully. And for uh, for Linux, uh, that's just a single project. And again, just some package references, reference to shared project plus plus these uh, required uh, package manifest, store logo, and uh, the Fluent UI font. Yeah, that should be enough. Let's go back here. Um, let's make a method that will return some. Uh, let's let's make it simple for now and return the state of the of the trigger of the left trigger, for example, for the horizontal positioning, for example. So let's do static. Parameter will be the ID and yeah, this index, yes. And the index is actually a number, so let's do a number. And it will return a number again. Mm -hmm. It's just warning, and now let's do navigator get game pads. Uh, actually, I'm not sure what happens if one of the game pads is disconnected and the other ones are pushed forward. Hmm, I should probably not use the index then. Because the index will change as the gamepads will move forward. And I have to check if the ID property is actually working here. So navigator get gamepads. Gamepad list. So let's do first one. Okay, so the ID, ID of the gamepad is it's name which is not very useful if you have multiple xbox controllers for example the id will be the same for all of them i guess hmm. i have to bring another controller to check it Controller number two. Let's do this. Devices added. Oh, does it even have? Yeah, it has Bluetooth. Good. So we are connecting. Yeah, connected. So. Now we have two gamepads here. This is the second one, index two, or index one. And let's see the IDs. Yeah, the same ID. So we cannot use ID for uniqueness as it's definitely not uh, unique. And there is nothing else that can be used for uniqueness. What happens if I disconnect the first one? Uh, yeah, so it disappeared, and what is now? All oh, right, so when I disconnected the first one, the second one still stays on the first index of the list, so it doesn't disrupt the positioning. And when I reconnect it, what happens? Hmm. 
uh, have to remove it, I'll probably. Yeah. Connect. So when I re uh, reconnect it, it actually returned to the first position automatically. So it's probably good as we can rely on the index for uh, for retrieval and state of the uh, of the game pads. So let's do based on the ID. Let's get the game pad. Now we have to check if it's not null. Because if it is, we return a zero. And if it's not null, we will try to retrieve the access. So gamepad access. So this is the array. Um, let's check first. Uh, we can what's the mapping about if you can check uh, how many access and buttons the gamepad actually has like we can check it by checking the length of the axis and buttons array but if there's something more user-friendly for for that uh, the mapping so String indicate whether the browser has remapped the controls to a known layout. A standard gamepad. Remapping. All right, so huh, that's interesting. That's that's gonna be useful. So this is how a standard standard gamepad looks, and this is the layout of the buttons. So as you can see, that there's the A button, B button. X button and epsilon button, uh, the two thumbsticks with the axis, so horizontal and a vertical axis, the same here, and there are some additional buttons which are the ones which are here on the controller, plus the back, forward, home button and the, the triggers as well as the bumpers. Okay, that's very useful and that's what we will definitely need. I would be interested in how this works with, for example, Switch, which has A and B button as well, but uh, in switched locations, so the B button is the bottom one. So it would make sense if that one go uh, was the cancel button, so to speak. But um, we'll probably not be able to test it without <laughs> having the specific type of gamepad connected. But for now, let's let's uh, be satisfied with this one. So let's go with access zero for the left stick. Or let's me we can even even check here. So if gamepad is null or gamepad axis length uh, equals zero. So if there are no axes, we return zero. And if there is an axis, so we can do game. We can return gamepad axis. Zero. <clears throat> Good. And let's see how we can hook it up to the gamepad class. For WebAssembly, of course. And we will probably have a shared method here. So let's go to gamepad, generate it. Yeah, I have remembered now that I actually broken these 
uh, not implemented not implemented uh, markers during the merge or rebase so I will have to do it here again so it's gonna be implemented on mm, let's implement it everywhere like the class itself uh, we have gamepads collection which can be implemented everywhere get current reading which we will implement for now in WebAssembly and finally these two gamepad edit we have now on Android iOS <coughs> WebAssembly and macOS and the same here Oh, okay, maybe it's, it's limited just to these platforms in all cases. I just don't need this. So I don't have to worry about Skia and the others for now at least. These two and somewhere here uh, this one is get current reading that's fine but I change this one all oh, right the class itself like this good uh, there is an interface I can controller which I guess we will need to implement as well. And the other one was iGameController battery info. So we don't need it for now because we don't have battery implemented by this one. Let's take it out of here. Right. It's a buff. I right here i game controller and from its properties we have the headset we don't have the headset the wireless property not now uh, oh right so <laughs> we actually don't support any of those properties at least for now Mm, that means I will probably do it like this just to have the interface there so that it doesn't show not implemented but it will be not implemented on uh, like its properties will not be implemented the interface, is, the interface itself will be there right like this and I will use this marker here good that's good right so with that let's go back here and continue with the implementation so for we have the gate get game pad state method. Uh, oh, I've lost it. Not here. State. Oh, reading current reading. This one. Let's put it in the shared file. The events below them here. Uh, there will be no shared logic, so I will put it directly in the WebAssembly file instead. 
right and let's try actually getting the state of the tri or the left trigger not trigger uh, thumbstick reading and let's call the JS API JS uh, type dot what's it called get left <laughs> so it's not trigger it's a uh, sound thumbstick get left thumbstick X I probably didn't consolidate that into a single method for all the buttons and all states at once but uh, for now at least just uh, we'll try to keep it simple and then uh, refactor as needed right and I have to make sure that the struct has only internal constructor oh I cannot do that because it has to be public as it's a struct right uh, never mind so what does it say? Yeah, it's a sign, but reading is it's never used. So the result here, and now we have to parse it. So if double try parse result outwar x. Reading thumbstick x left thumbstick x this way and return the reading here. <clears throat> uh, that was pretty simple. And let's verify it actually does work. So instead of doing it here, I'll probably switch to Windows just for a moment and implement a test page that will. Uh, you know, visualize, um, visualize the, visualize the results of our work. So, we have cross targeting. Switch to Windows. And in there, let's go to Windows Gaming and create a new test page here. It's going to be blank test page and it's going to be called, for example, Gamepad Reading Test. Get a button, get current reading, and there will be a lot of text boxes. Run text left thumbstick X, run X bind. Let's use, let's use X bind to bind it to a property so let's do a cleanup first and sample let's call this one uh, let's keep it consistent it's just gamepad let's do 
gamepad enumeration. Like this. Oh, current reading. And we will need a view model for this one. So we'll just type of gamepad. Good, and it's to derive from view model base. Now let's do this data context changed. Subject. And let's do, let's make a property for it. Good. And with that, we have we will have a I command get current reading command or create command. Right. And here, uh, let's let's get the reading of the first gamepad that we have in the collection of gamepads, uh, just for simplicity for now. First of default. Gamepad equals now. Short circuit and do nothing. Actually, create a property for gamepad reading current reading and let's set it to a new gamepad reading just to clear it out. Nice property changed reading like this and if it's not now, let's get the current reading from the gamepad. Right, and again, raise property changed. Ah, let's make it <laughs> nicer here. Like this, else branch. Right, much better. And now let's switch it to this format. That's better. All right. Why is it complaining to me? Expect it here. Good. Okay, so we have this. I will just set the default bind mode to one way so that we see the changes and don't have to write it here in mode and do view model dot current reading dot left thumbstick x that's good oh closing tag let's do the same thing for left thumbstick epsilon Hmm. Here, right, thumbstick X. Good. Y. 
some. Ah, uh, for now these, and I will add. Ah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do the buttons as well. Oh, let's I buttons. Uh, I will have to parse them out. So let's do at least the triggers. Right trigger. And let's just try just outputting the buttons directly. If it works, if it can handle the flags or not. We'll see. What else is there? Uh, thumb six, yeah, buttons, and there is a timestamp. We want that definitely. So I set it here. Stamp. Right. Good. Okay, that's all. We're showing all the interesting properties and let's run this. Where are we? Hmm, this is weird. I just hope it's not a actual problem. Still building. Well, that's weird. Some failures there. Hmm. Hopefully it's not nothing serious. All right, we have sample set running and let's check how it works. Gaming, Windows, uh, where is it? Oh, who? Oh. Game, oh, that's a category. Oh, that was wrong, but let's fix it later. And of course, I forgot to put it in a stack panel. So let's do spacing, eight. It's not gonna reload right now. Let's close it and fix the category. So the sample name is Gamepad Quick Grant Reading. And here as well, it's name. And the category should be Windows Gaming. Okay, so category Windows 
gaming. Ja. Spelling. <laughs> right. Let's go first. And here. Okay. Let's try again. Attribute expected. Oh, right. So view model type. And here. Okay, that's fine. So for free to 3.2, we have a uh, Tyson project template coming in the solution template. So when you in, will install the new Uno platform uh, extension in your Visual Studio, we'll get the Tyson project template as well. And many of the new features I'm implementing are getting the Tyson support as well, like the contact picker, analytics, analytics info support, uh, there was also package ID and many others. So all these will be able to run on Tizen as well. So we're looking forward to variables like uh, watches and fitness bands with Uno platform applications running. Yeah, also refrigerators. Here we go. Windows Gaming, current reading. So, get current reading, same nothing. Oh, I didn't hook it up. Okay. Ah, basic mistakes, which cost us a lot of time waiting for bills, but it's UWP, so it's at least a little bit faster than the other platforms. Command X bind, view model cat current reading command. Now we're okay. I hope so. And also this should be arrow but get equals. Oh it's actually creating just once. It's fine. Alright. And we're building. <clears throat> Let's go back to PRs and see what's happening. We are now pushing nullable slots. So in many places in the code base, we are adding nullable <clears throat> so that we have uh, more coverage for uh, and, uh, more protection against null reference uh, exceptions. I'm working on a teaching tip control, uh, which is quite complicated actually, even though it doesn't look like it, but <clears throat> well, now I'm currently on uh, 6,000 lines of code and most of it is just actually teaching tip uh, main, f main uh, code file, which has uh, over 2,000 lines of code and which is mostly positioning and making sure the teaching tip is sized properly and so on. <clears throat> right, so samples application, current reading. Huh. Doesn't seem like, oh, here we go. So when I push the thumbstick to left, you have one here, one, one, one. 
Right, so this works. Let's try a button. A, and two buttons once. Yeah, so it's output, outputting correctly. Yeah. And let's try these. Left shoulder. Two shoulders at once. And trigger is also showing the proper value there. So that's good. So we have current reading of gamepad. And let's now check how it works on WebAssembly. I'll just add a little padding there so it's nicer. Now let's push this sample page. Confirm that. Let's go to WebAssembly again. WebAssembly. Oh, I didn't show you <laughs> the most important new feature in uh, 3.1, which is uh, Skia support. And we have uh, WPF and Linux support there, so I have to show that as well. <clears throat> I kind of forgot about that when I was showing WebAssembly, and now I just remembered. So let's go to Skia first. So in for Skia we have uh, three three backends. Uh, one is for WPF, so it is a classic WPF application which will run on older version of Windows, so Windows uh, Seven, for example. You can see that the Tizen head is already there, but it's not yet uh, stable. So we are leaving that for 3.2 or later releases. Okay. The actual Skia implementation is shared across all these. So for the WPF, Tizen, and GTK, most of the code, well, basically all the UI code is the same. Only the platform-specific APIs which are bound to the system, like non-UI APIs, are platform-specific. So adding a new platform is actually super easy. You just create a new uh, runtime project here, like runtime skia dot something and do a create a host uh, host file that actually hosts the uh, hosts the project and displays the skia drawing canvas and that one then will display the actual application that's rendered by skia sharp and uno platform and for implementing the platform specific features then we have api extensibility concept which registers some implementation of extensions for interfaces so then in the uno platform source code we search for an implementation of the extension and use that 
to actually surface that platform specific feature on the given target. Come on, so uh, the first build is taking a little bit longer, but otherwise uh, Skia builds are much faster and even the incremental builds are much faster than for the other platforms. So we actually use Skia a lot for, for testing of new features as it makes makes it much faster for us to iterate. And you can even do the C sharp edit and continue uh, feature which currently fails on on Xamarin. All right, I have some issues there. Uh, gamepad is not, does not contain definition, okay. Let's see. Not here, but gamepad. I probably forgot some Skia reference there. Get game pet. Yes, yes, this, this is it. I need these. Right. That will help. So GTK is the most interesting one, actually. That's the target that allows us to get Uno platform run on on Linux. And GTK is a cross-platform UI library as well. So we are rendering on top of it using Skia Sharp. <clears throat> and you can not only run the GTK application on Linux, but you can also run it on Windows. So it's it's a great way to implement new features for for Skia Linux and then just run it on Linux because it will work thanks to GTK. Are we close? I hope so. The last uh, now it's building the actual samples app for Skia. And we should be up and running very soon. There we go. So this is the host for WPF and here we have WPF application running. Uh, it's still a little bit limited. There are some, some issues with uh, list views and so on, but it's, it's, wor it's working and you can start building your applications knowing that in future releases that will be much improved. But you can see the, the hour states and states of clicking and so input support is mostly there. So uh, there is a lot of things coming soon. And with WPF support, we can actually take window WinUI applications to uh, Windows 7 before Microsoft was able to do that. So that's pretty cool, right? It even supports the fluent design styles and so on. Okay. Let's go back and try the GTK just to show it actually works as well. Okay, GTK is building. And it's running, so that's GTK. Just 
loading here. And this is Uno Platform GTK application using Skia Sharp. I just ignore these, these are just warnings uh, because one of the features is not implemented. But again, it's running and it allows the same things like hit buttons. You have everything works the same way because it's just Skia Sharp. So nothing different here just works. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. <laughs> As Uno platform everywhere. And when you run it on Linux, it will look exactly the same as well. Right. So let's go back to GamePad. So we have uh, our sample in and we have implemented the left thumbstick X uh, axis. So let's launch it, see it, if it actually works and then we will continue building up on that. What I was interested in is what the mapping is. So the mapping, it's a standard here. I'm not sure what the allowed values for that are. Gamepad mapping style. So that is only standard and nothing so far. So the no mapping is in use and there is standard mapping. So I guess a standard will be the thing that's gonna be used the most. Gamepad interface button. Uh, yeah, this, this should be fine. It should be easy. We'll just follow the st standard gamepad layout and we should be good. Let me check how PS controller layout. So PlayStation has What is the meaning of those buttons? I'm sure there is a specific meaning. So, ah. What is the back button? Hmm. Hmm. Some kind of usual mapping, like what it means, what the buttons actually mean. I don't, I'm not sure because I don't have PlayStation. Maybe it's the time to <laughs> to get it. <laughs> hmm. That's not very useful. Because it doesn't tell me what the buttons actually mean. Like some comparison of Joystick button zero is A, and in case of, seems like the layout for Unity is the same thing as the standard mapping. All right, so X button. Share button index uh, have conflicting mappings. X is button one, 
for PS4 and Ace button 0 for Xbox. But A and X do the same thing, which is a bit confusing because we will have to make some mapping decision on how we how we map those. I guess I guess you can go with the standard layout. Just say A is the, the bottom one on Xbox controller and it will match whatever is there on PS4 and uh, the developer has to decide if that's what they need or is if something else more appropriate there. Let's go to the browser and let's verify if our our reading is functional. Right, let's go to go to Windows Gaming, <clears throat> and in there to get current reading. And let's see. So first time we should get nothing. Like it's not even initialized yet, but now we should definitely be getting something. I have to check if oh there is an exception. What is that? Oh, it can't read property axis of undefined on... Oh, right. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? Uh, navigator... Camera... Pads... Right. Zero... It's fine, it's, it's there, so I'm not sure what's happening. All right, we can make a break point. Let's make a break point here. And on this location. All right, we're not passing any ID. Oh, that's that's the problem. Can I break it? Uh, come on, stop. Stop it, stop it. Ah, uh, we're frozen here. Oh. That's not what I wanted. Oh, it crashed. All right, let's go back. Uh, we're not passing any ID, and we will just pass in the index of the controller, and that should be enough. Gamepad WebAssembly. We should be storing the ID somewhere, so. Oh, let's remove this to make it easier to read. Oh no, don't freeze. Now that's the problem. Okay, so the ID, we store it here. And I'm not sure why you even Convert it to a string as it's a number, but I guess that's 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 okay for now. Let's check if V three C. What is it? Uh, K 
fucking oh not this I just to check if uh, the type of the ID is always a number so the, yeah so the index is always a long so uh, let's, let's do it so that we have it in line with what they have in uh, WebAssembly yeah so try get value Right, so we have uh, IDs in uh, here. So the gamepad cache is also string based. So let's do it like this. And then all these are just not strings, but long. So the connected gamepad IDs should be just numbers. So let's split it and then <clears throat> do the split and then select ID long parse. So we have uh, longs there to array. Now let's do a tool list. Tool is more efficient. Right, so we fixed uh, the long differences and now we have to pass it here. Like this, so that should be enough. That should be enough. I really hope it will work as we're nearing the end time of the stream. So I hope this will be a functional uh, piece that we'll, we'll build on next time, adding uh, the remaining remaining axes, remaining thumbsticks, remaining uh, triggers, uh, plus the remaining buttons. Map those to the gamepad reading, and we'll have that for WebAssembly, and then we will start doing the same for the other platforms as well. I want to make a, a separate stream as well for the Tizen support as well, but I don't have any Tizen device right now, so I will have to uh, get that. We have actually a Tizen fridge, which could possibly allow connecting a <laughs> connecting a gamepad, so so hope, uh, hopefully at least that will be a viable option. Let's even let's check in that. Uh, family hub, uh, Bluetooth, gamepad. I think it it is possible to connect the gamepad to. Uh, to the to the family hub refrigerator which because there is a Bluetooth connection possibility and 
someone's playing Doom on the on the fridge. Right? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, so, so we can connect uh, controller to game uh, so, to the Samsung Samsung fridge and play Doom on it. It's pretty funny. Come on. All right, so we have this running, and let's hope it it, it actually does work. Very close. We're very close. So Windows Gaming. Current reading. And let's see. Uh, uh, it seems something is still off. An error there. Okay. What is it? Okay, so it seems like this is running fine. Uh, I guess I know why we have problems there. Or not. So gamepad is okay. Access link is not. Zero. Oh, what is that? All right. Um. Okay. The code has to be like this because that makes sense. Right. So that returns a value, but we don't see it here, and it's because of binding because the build actually strips out what is not used, and in our case. It doesn't recognize that the gamepad reading properties are actually used. So we have to fix that. Come on, <laughs> it keeps running. Come on, stop it, stop it. Mm. It's gonna crash anyway, so let's just kill it. Oh, goodbye. Run, and now... Web assembly. So here we are. So what I needed to fix is in gamepad TS is to do this. If not gamepad or XSR empty and then in the in the test page maybe I find it faster here. Gaming reading test. I will have to make separate properties for all these, uh, all these props uh, or fields of uh, gamepad reading. I'll actually make it uh, to make it simpler now. I can just say in the book right line uh, 
just say debug write line current reading dot Uh, what is the name of the property? Uh, we just uh, still loading, so I don't see the intelligence help here. Oh no! So it's waking up, but slowly. Property is a left trigger. Or no, left a uh, thumbstick X. This one. I'll just output in here in debug, which will also make sure that the property is not removed during build. But for later, I will have to separate it into separate properties and just output it one by one, which will be more time consuming just to write it. So I just skip this step for now and we'll do it next time in uh, next stream but we're almost there i think this will work we should be able to see the gamepad status so we have so this <laughs> so that's uh, thanks to xCloud it's running on the Samsung fridge pretty funny but actually we can now use uh, also Uno platform as the test for uh, for does it run a uh, given device because we have uh, Uno platform running on Raspberry Pi we have no platform running on watches. We have no platform running on Tesla. So <laughs> we can use also no platform as the test for does it run anywhere, everywhere. So this was uh, WebAssembly. I was actually looking into how the implementation will look on iOS. That should be also quite simple as iOS is this game controller class and I am pretty sure that the API allows us to get get the state as well here so like this it should get the access value so that should be a very similar thing to what we have in a WebAssembly just in iOS right uh, debug doesn't exist okay okay of course it doesn't, so it's system diagnostics. Yeah. The debug it should be fine. And yeah, so so it will be a very similar thing here. Just getting the state of uh, different properties from GC controller and surfacing them in uh, gamepad reading feature all right so so that's gonna probably the plan for the next stream for gamepad api and uh, i'm actually a little bit <laughs> afraid of the android one because in android that there doesn't seem to be a way to get the current state of the axis but you have to uh, observe events instead of uh, polling them so that will mean we'll have to observe the events every time and only when we are requested by polling we will get the latest state that was there although it's not the most performant way to do it i guess there is no other way and but in most cases there will be no gamepad so we can just ignore those uh, input events and it shouldn't be a big problem You can actually check how mono game does it. Mono game gamepad, there is not here, but there should be a platform specific folder input 
Gamepad Android. And here we have, yeah, I've been looking into this before, so that's the exact the same case as it gets the input device and then it observes key up and key down and generic motion events to check for the current values. So that's a little bit, a little bit annoying, but it should still work and shouldn't cause much issues. Here we go, here we go. Let's open the debugger just to or the console just so we know if we break something. Let's go to gaming and current reading. Uh, we got no values. Oh that's unfortunate. But in the console we can see now that the value is returned. It's actually showing the right value. So although the, the binding itself doesn't work for some unknown reason to me, uh, the value is actually passed in and it's 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 uh, retrieved on this side. So I guess the only thing we need to do later is to fix the sample to actually show the values properly and that's going to be by breaking down the property into properties into separate separate uh, parts not just one single property current reading all right so that will be probably for all for today and the next time we will continue with uh, fixing the samples and then implementing ios inputs as well so I thank you all for joining. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for next stream, uh, write me on Twitter and I will see you next time.